Hi, Hirvat. Hello, Mark. Uh, announcing the conversation uh, on the web, we said that the, the main topic will be the image of the future of Armenia, Artsakh, and Armenians around the world. So let's start with this broad question. How do you see the future for Armenia? Okay. Um, the future for Armenia and for Armenians, hmm? I see it to be bright, hmm? um, looking forward. Hmm? Uh, we had bright past, we have bright future. And in my mind, one key that brings us to that brightness is our ability to adapt, okay? Adaptation is a key element. And coming from the technology world, coming from Silicon Valley, being creator and user of technology, I see that Armenians with their adaptation capability, they will be able to adapt to situations, especially my recommendation will be to adapt to new technologies uh, in terms of using them to the best and creating them to the best. And with that, we will be ahead, okay? Of course, technology is a gift to the world. And it's not a fixed thing, it changes. It changes every year, it changes every day. Uh, adapting to technology is not one time event, right? It's a continuous effort. But I think our adaptation capability as Armenians can help us and help, can help the world and help, can help also our role in the world if we are ahead of many other nations in adapting and in contributing to that domain. Saying that being adaptive and saying uh, the, uh, being innovative or creative, they are very close to each other, but they are, dif they are, they are different things. Because to be creative, you, have, uh, you should have some uh, sort of uh, leadership skills or as, at least show some leadership. Being adaptive is being headed by anyone and just adapting to what that anyone says. Yes. Now, where can be uh, can we be creative and innovative? In which yeah. uh, fields or in which parts? How do you see sure. that? I, I personally think that both are important in reality, because by even by being adaptive, meaning by being, if you look at technology, there are people who create technology and people who use technology. Right. Uh, of course, the ones who create it are much smaller group in the world. The, the ones who use it are everyone in the world, and that keeps increasing. After COVID, every single person in the world is now technology savvy because technology saved us during that lockdown period. People, even who did not want to use technology, were forced to do that. Were forced to use the most advanced tools in order to to continue life. So, so it's true that everybody in the world is a technology user, but not at the same level. Uh, people use technology at different levels, even among a family, among a, a, a nation. Not everybody has the same adaptation capability to novelty. Hmm? Adaptation is change, right? So not everybody is ready to do changes quickly. So, so I think putting the adaptation aspect or the user aspect, I think Armenians or Armenia should be more open to change, more open to adopting new technologies by adapting to the situations. We shouldn't be the followers, we should be leaders in that. And, and technology is not in one segment, it's not an isolated segment. In everything we do, technology has a presence, right? The hardware, the software are turning everything to smart. So smartness is what we like to, to, to adopt. Uh, the smallest thing that we use is becoming smart, right? It's not only the car is smart, can drive itself, even your pen is smart, your, your shoe is smart. So uh, smartness is something that we need to learn how to adapt to. And then we move with that to improve our life and our contribution. So let's put the users aside for a moment and come to your question about the, the innovation. And the innovation is the creation of the technology, not the usage of it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, creating technology means that you need to have the, the, the brilliant mind of bringing novelty. Mm -hmm. um, today, that innovation is commercialized, is globalized. Mm -hmm. In the past, I had to work my first 10 years of my career at Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. What Graham Bell has created, the first place where the telephone, the transistor, the communication was created. Because that was the concentration of innovation, of creativity. Since then, 
that creativity became much more commercialized. It's anywhere in the world you can be creative. Hmm? With the revolution of the internet, that is uh, easy communication, free communication. Hmm? With the evolution of smart engines, smart computers, unlimited amount of memory, everybody can be creative. Hmm? So that's why I don't see a limit, geographical limit that is, to people who would like to contribute to technology. That's why Armenians can, can be there without issues. Now, I'll come back to your question in one more step, perhaps. You said, in what domain? Technology is so wide these days. It's very hard to do creativity in every single domain. We need to find centers of excellence in certain domains of technology to create a crowd, to educate, to do research, to create startups, and so on, but not in every domain, but rather in certain domains, OK? OK, now uh, your answer. Uh, prompted three other questions, in fact. Okay. <laughs> let, 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 let me start them uh, um, uh, one by one. Uh, and one of the things you said is uh, being create. you can be creative anywhere in the world. And that's absolutely yeah. true. Uh, yeah. When you are nowadays creative, wherever you are, you can also earn money by being creative, right? Of course, of course. It's of course. not only about, you know, just just opening up your creative mind and creative soul. It's also about uh, monetization of your creative uh, uh, capabilities. And uh, so do we have a good start? Are we in a good place to start uh, thinking like that? I, I think so. We have, it, it maybe not a very popular and not a very large number, but we do have a very good number of people who are looking not only to create, but also to create and monetize that creation. Now, not everybody who creates technology needs to have, needs to be the CEO of a startup. Some people think that way. I'd like to say that in advance, that not everybody is an entrepreneur. Not every single person needs to be a CEO. Then the companies will be a single person companies, right? <laughs> Nobody will be working. So we need people who create, who are part of the ranks, still making good money, still getting good salaries and so on. So you can monetize your creativity by being part of a multinational company, by working at Facebook, at Google, at Synopsys, at Cisco, elsewhere. So you can be part of a multinational company and make good money, but also you can create your own startup, you be an entrepreneur and make more money perhaps uh, by, if you are successful, of course there is the risk that, the 10% success factor we know with startups. But if your startup is among the 10% that will succeed, you can make much more money. That's the risk and reward concept that we all know from Silicon Valley. So yes, monetization is definitely there. Now, I've started this series of interviews uh, together with the Future Studio, of course, uh, in December, last December. Yeah. Since then, we are talking almost every single week to very different people, very interesting people, specialists and experts in their sphere. Uh, and everybody says that Armenia has to change. Actually, the change in Armenia is becoming one of the main topics of our conversation. But, and you said also, we, we should be ready to change. Yes. Being, being ready to change in itself means a change. Because nowadays, many people in Armenia are not ready to change. On the other hand, I've seen people in villages, in remote villages in Armenia, villages where they don't have, uh, you know, natural gas, gasoline, as mm -hmm. you say in America. Yeah. Uh, but they have internet. And they are using Skype to connect with their relatives, wherever their relatives are. So it is already a change and it is quite a significant change. Sure. The main point is there should be a how, there should be, say, a roadmap for changes. And this roadmap has to be for changes for very different people in towns and villages, in the big city, which is Yerevan, and Gyumri, of course, uh, elders and youngers, school children, and, and everybody else. How can we create this roadmap? Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, 
I, I don't believe in master roadmaps. I believe in efforts, in initiatives, in attempts to do things, right? It could be multiple projects because there are various people with various interests, right? Maybe it's not one top-down uh, mandate that will change everything, right? But there are changes that we are already seeing. We need to, to increase them. Hmm? The changes in Yerevan have come much earlier. Hmm? And I see that change from generations. Hmm? In the company that I work, Synopsys, we hire 100 person every year, okay? We increase our, our workforce. Of course, we have limitations. That's why we moved to Gimri recently. We can talk about these things later. But uh, with every new generation that we hire, we bring in, we see the change. The new generation is much more open-minded. It's much more autonomous, knows multiple languages, uh, is... Uh, very, very fast in learning, in adapting, and so on. So even though we are adapters from the beginning, but with every generation, we see the change. The younger is even better. Now, but we, for that to happen, we need to educate. We need to mentor. We need to prepare. Hmm? When we do the preparation, the change is there. Hmm? That's why, for instance, we work with universities. We work with high schools. Because if we do that change from early stage, hmm, the change is faster, more fundamental. I don't want to say that the, the, the more the adults will not change. They will also change. I have a program that I like a lot. We have this um, women empowerment program for women in villages, okay? Uh, HBU created this WE program, which I love it because it takes women who have entrepreneurial skills in the Marses, mentors them, teaches them courses, and trains them to become successful CEOs of small startup companies in their own villages. So, uh, and I see the change in their behavior, in their mentality, in their work from the first day they come, three months after, six months after, you have to notice those changes. And these are not young children. These are not university students. These are adults hmm, who have decided to produce uh, clothes, to produce soaps, to do touristic services, but to create their own company, hire a couple of people, get some budget, do their own marketing, their own finance, and so on. And they, they turn to that. So, so they are ready to adapt. Again, it's the Armenian adaptability possibilities. Even sitting in a remote village somewhere, you can make that change. And these are adults. So I, I think change is possible, but you have to have a project. You have to work on them. It shouldn't be a one-time thing. You have to work with them an entire year to help them, to mentor them, to teach them courses, to teach them computer or the tech savviness, right? Uh, business fundamentals. So when you teach them that, we have seen this with 10 different groups so far, 25 ladies in each group. So you do one, you move to the next. It's like a conveyor belt. You're manufacturing nice entrepreneurs with, 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 a, with a system that's moving through. It's a very, very good example, but it's only 100, uh, 10, 10 groups of 25 each. So it's limited still. We need many projects like this in order to scale, in order to cover the entire country and Artsakh. By the way, one of those groups was from Artsakh as well, 25 ladies from Artsakh. I'm just giving it as one example. There are many such examples where you see the change coming very nicely. Uh, and the third question, which comes out of uh, yes. your first answer, is about centers of excellence. You yes. said that. Uh, the development cannot go in all directions simultaneously. There should be chosen some uh, directions and, and sort of uh, uh, form centers of excellence in each direction. Which directions they, these can be? Okay, we have one direction that I'm, I'm familiar with, which was successful. I can use that as an example. And then we can look at what else can be done similarly. Mm -hmm. The direction that I was involved in from the early 90s, when I brought some education, some research labs to Armenia, 94, 95. And then we, we brought in startups from Silicon Valley to Armenia. That was the first stage in the mid 90s, uh, was in the microelectronics domain, in chip design. You know, the backbone of all these technological innovation are the chips. The reason we're getting, we're improving technology year after year because the chips are becoming faster, more knowledgeable, with more memory, with more processing power. But in order to, to design twice faster and twice smaller chip every year, 
you need continuously to build your, your, your talent, your knowledge and so on. So in the mid nineties, we started with that. We built in research lab initially at AUA with, with some AGBU funding. We started that effort. Then we brought two, three companies in 94, 95, 99 to, to Armenia. Uh, and these companies brought Silicon Valley culture to Armenia. It was important and brought the talents and started working with universities on creating more people. When multinationals such as Synopsys came, they didn't start companies in Armenia. When VMware came to Armenia, when Cisco came to Armenia, they did not start companies. They rather acquired startups that were in Silicon Valley with research and development in Armenia. So which means that uh, they have built their talents based on existing startups and they have acquired them and moved with them. So this particular field, chip design, became a critical field today. And Armenia is one of the most important global contributors to this field. Most of the chips today around the world do use building blocks that are built in Armenia. We may not know that. In your telephones, when you're using your application processor, whichever brand it is, it has in it blocks that are designed in Armenia. Self-testing, uh, self-repairing blocks, communication blocks, DDRs, USBs, these are all made by our company for us. I know it because of a fact, right? Uh, and Armenia is not behind anyone else. Today, the most advanced technology is three nanometer. Hmm? We have designs in three nanometer going on in Armenia and they teach customers in Japan, in Korea, in the US, in Europe, how to do it. So we are the ones who are supplying the building blocks, if you want, from Armenia for these chips to happen. So you're playing a global role there. So I think one of the successes is that, but we need to keep feeding it. So I'll come back to the education and how to feed the pipeline. But I think similar to this example of the microelectronics domain, the chip design, we can create other domains as well. Biotech is one, FinTech is one, Cybersecurity is another, but I will concentrate on one particular one, which we already have a base in Armenia, that is artificial intelligence. Similar to the semiconductor or microelectronics that I mentioned, that is the backbone of technology. Today's back, new backbone of technology, in addition to the microelectronics, is AI. AI is not one sector. It's not only AI in education or AI in finance or AI in health. AI will be or is already part of everything we do. If my car is self-driving, it's because of AI. If my video is doing filtering with you now because of AI is, is cleaning my, my picture with you. So AI is everywhere. So developing AI talents in Armenia and building startups based on AI and so on will be fundamental. So I think investing in that domain from education to research to companies will, will be also very important. Uh, I was smiling when you were talking about the artificial intelligence because I was doing some elements of it in 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows how old I am. <laughs> yeah, as, a linguist, yeah. as a linguist, I was participating yeah. in some uh, I research. See. And even my PhD uh, had um, some, some connection to the ideas of artificial intelligence. Yes, yes. Anyway, but we are always coming back to the topic of synopsis uh, as, say, as an educational institution. Uh, you have a, a very important income, uh, sorry, input in uh, the educational system because you are also the president of the Armenian Virtual College. Now, uh, Synopsis as an educational institution, what is it doing? And are, uh, are you content with the level of education that Synopsis gives in Armenia? Yes. Um, so why is Synopsis involved in education in Armenia? Mm -hmm. We have locations all around the world. You know, we have a large number of countries. We have research and development centers in over 40 countries now. Uh, these are the, just the creators of, them. okay. But Armenia particularly, we found that it's a very important center for us in terms of knowledge, growth, uh, 
stability in terms of workforce, people don't change jobs very fast and so on. So it has many advantages from technical to, 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 to people oriented in Armenia. But what we missed in Armenia is the preparation, preparedness, hmm? being ready to work, being ready to contribute at early stage. And also uh, we missed that is quality. We missed also the quantities. We don't have enough people naturally coming from the universities unless we go to the universities and participate in the education program. So the education program that you mentioned for Synopsis, it is meant for preparing talents, but not only for Synopsis, but also for other companies. So we don't stop at, at creating talents. We, we create talents, we hire 50% of them, and we leave the other 50% to the rest of the market to, to enjoy. It should be like that because you are a good citizen. You have to contribute to the to the country where you're benefiting from. Now, uh, the reason again that we're doing it is to prepare talent. So what we did instead of creating our own separate university or education program, we decided to work with existing universities, but create joint degrees, create a curriculum that is partially uh, provided by Synopsis, and it's not Synopsis specific. It's what is being taught here at Stanford or at Berkeley. So we're taking courses that are advanced enough and we're putting it part of the curriculum. We're providing in, in teaching them. So we provide some talents from our workforce to do the teaching. Some of it comes from the universities. Um, we provide the labs, again, expensive uh, labs. Uh, we provide also a stipend to the teachers. We provide stipend to the students, all to, 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 to make that happen. So you need to, to, to play all the roles. But we had to work with four universities, not one, to have enough people. So we started with Polytechnic, we added the Yerevan State University, then more, then European, then Russian, and now the, the Polytechnic in, in Gimri as well. So we're working with them for this joint bachelor, joint master's, joint PhD programs hmm, to create the talent. So that is our, that's why we come to this education in order to prepare the, the quality and the quantity necessary. But even with this, the quantity is still low mark. So um, we don't have enough people to hire. You may know perhaps that the, the technology sector is missing enough talents in Armenia to hire. Many companies, even us, we have lists of positions that we cannot fill them. And if you don't fill this 30 people project for six months, it will not stay in Armenia. I have to take it to some other country in, in East Europe or in, in Asia, I will not name the countries, but naturally the, those, those open positions will go elsewhere and therefore the funding will go elsewhere. So we need to create enough people and therefore we need to enhance the universities and not only that, that will bring me to the high schools. So we need to provide more STEM education. STEM, you know what is of course, right? Science, technology, engineering and math. Um, so STEM education, we have to strengthen it in the high schools. We, we do have a problem there, especially high schools in the regions, in the Marses. We do have a problem there and we need to, to enhance that. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, the IT sphere, we don't need many people working at the IT sphere. Say uh, we need just, you know, a couple of thousands. Okay, 10,000 people. Uh, 50,000, but it's still not very much. Uh, these people must be highly educated. That means there should be serious investments in, in a small group of people, relatively small group of people. They, when they are starting to work, they are parts of big multinational companies, uh, corporations, and how do they participate in building the Armenian economy? Yes, um, in, in multiple ways. First of all, let me go to the first part of your statement, then we'll come mm -hmm. to, the, to the multinationals and startups. Mm -hmm. The first part is that, do we only need 10, 20,000 people? No, That's the, these are the numbers today, but we are lacking today's needs, but that it can become much, much more. If we have good talent, there is lack of, lack of people, lack of good resources everywhere in the world in Silicon Valley. If, if we have 50,000, if we have 100,000 people in Armenia, well-educated technologists, 
I am sure companies will come. I, I spoke to several companies in the past. Mm -hmm. They would come, Intel would come to Armenia and will start if they can start a location of 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. If you cannot supply them 5,000 technologies, they would not bother to come because for them, it's not scalable. They will go elsewhere where they, where they already are. They can expand it. So for large multinationals to come, they need good number of people to hire good technologies. And this is not just low level IT. We're not talking about people who develop websites or, or write apps and so on. This is R&D, this is research and development. So it needs at least master's degree uh, and it needs fundamental knowledge and that will, so just for the numbers, I think we can absorb lots of companies in Armenia if we, 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 we have more talents. So my, uh, my message is for young kids, high schools, universities to move towards that domain because knowledge-based economy hmm, uh, brings money to the individuals and to the country. Hmm? And R&D is knowledge-based. It's not, you're not a worker. You're not cleaning something, cooking something. You are actually creating knowledge and knowledge is paid well. Hmm? Now, uh, let's come back to the, where, what can they do? Multinationals versus startups. It's true that in the mid 2000s, we brought several multinationals, including Synopsis to Armenia. But since then, we have seen a new phenomena happening as well. While those multinationals kept growing in size in, in bringing new products and so on, but many startups started to be born in Armenia rather than come from outside. And today we have large hundreds and hundreds of startups that are created on an annual basis. We have total now 1,200 companies in Armenia. Back in early 90s, when I first came, there were three standalone companies. Today, we have 1,200 companies. Now, 1,200 companies, many, many of them are startups. Of course, not all of them, unfortunately, will succeed. In the startup world, some succeed, some don't. We know that. But today, we already have more than a dozen successful startups that were born in Armenia. They're already in Silicon Valley. They already have a branch or location or brought their headquarters. While keeping the engineering in Armenia, they brought their marketing, their finance, their sales offices to Silicon Valley. And we support that. We help that process for, for many years now. And there are more companies coming. In fact, we even created a program last year uh, in conjunction with the Ministry of High Tech on supporting Armenian technology companies, startups, to accelerate. You know, accelerate means take, not incubate. Incubate is the first stage where you, you put a company in incubation, you create a successful product and so on. And they would do that in Armenia. So once you are a little bit successful in Armenia, you already have a product in Armenia. Now accelerate means take it globally, expand it globally. So we created an acceleration program uh, between the government joint project and the AGBU Silicon Valley, which I happen to be heading. So we, we created together and we brought 15 startups from Armenia hmm? over 16 weeks time, gave them mentorship regularly, gave them 16 different courses hmm? from finance to marketing to uh, fundraising. So all of that uh, in order to give them that acceleration program. And many of them are now in the US as well and started to grow further and to accelerate. And it's not a one-time thing. We'll be repeating it for other groups of companies mm, as we go. But it was the first attempt, we called it the Armenian Virtual Bridge Program. Mm. Take 15 companies from Armenia, bring them to Silicon Valley, give them that acceleration with experts of Silicon Valley, non-Armenian experts mostly. Mm. Professors from Stanford, previous CEOs, people who have uh, in, in VC firms and so on. Mm. So we brought that knowledge to them and they, they learned and they accelerated. I think we can repeat the same thing in many, many groups. So if we have startups like that, we can marry them. And that's the strength of our nation being global, right? Being a global nation, we are not only in Armenia, we are in every country. If you need this particular domain from Silicon Valley, we'll, we'll, we'll make that happen. We have a very nice, very large community in Silicon Valley, not in numbers, but in terms of their distribution in major companies, with their experiences. We have so many CEOs from, from Armenian origin in Silicon Valley. We, we can leverage that. I'm sure the same thing happens with other fields elsewhere in the globe, but we need to leverage that for our future. Okay, now uh, 
in one of your interviews, you said that we must improve the quality of life in Armenia, which is absolutely true. Uh, and we should do that through uh, uh, improving economy and bringing in new technologies. But there is a gap, and you said uh, about that, there is a tech gap between the technological level of the Western world and Armenia. Uh, uh, how, how shall we deal with that? Um, Mark, technology is, I would say, almost free now. It's not free, it's almost free. It's very low cost. Hmm? You get the most intelligent devices in your hand that converge. You, you call it a telephone. It's not a telephone. It's a computer and a telephone and a, and a video camera and everything. It's a convergence device with almost zero cost, right? You can take a, even a self-driving car. The, the, the prices are going down very fast. Any, any smart engine is fast. The willingness to adapt, the willingness to change. We have to be open for that. If we don't try to change, if we don't try to adapt new solutions, new technologies, we will stay behind. And Armenians, in my understanding, are ready to for adapt adaptation. I was surprised with this COVID situation, and I don't know your opinion on it, but uh, I saw the resistance in Armenia for vaccination, for instance. And that's resistance to change, resistance to adopt technology. The vaccine is a new technology, is something new that was invented by, by, by the scientists to, to, to help every individual. But the, the nature or the mentality in Armenia resisted to that. I don't want to analyze it, but it's, a, it's change and it's adaption to change, which did not, did not take place. In some spheres, this adaptation takes uh, a lot of courage, a lot of willingness to change. I mean, look, mm -hmm. each self-driven uh, uh, taxi yes. would take the job out of one person and will leave probably a family uh, without income. So you can uh, see a huge uh, 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 resistance to the self-driven cars. Yes, but the taxi driver will have something more interesting to do, right? We used to have the telephone operators. You know, they used to link telephone lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They disappeared. Where are they? They're doing something more intelligent, more smart. So, so we need to, to move with the wave hmm, uh, to do something better, something more intelligent, more interesting and smarter, right? If we want to keep our old jobs only, that, that will keep us behind. Things will come and, and, and go, right? The, the horse carriages, where are they? They don't exist. If you stay with the horse carriage because that was what you used to do, you didn't adopt a car, then... And the self-driving cars, the same thing. Uh, they are facts, they are here. 10% of the cars here in Silicon Valley are already self-driving. So it's, it's, it's not difficult to see them doing their jobs, even though it is, it is difficult to create them. So we don't only become users, but we can help create the self-driving cars help create the artificial intelligence in the chip inside the car. And by the way, some of it is done in Armenia today hmm? uh, to, to be able to make the judgments of the driver so that the driver can read a newspaper or can, can do a conversation like this while the car is moving. Uh, you know, there was a movement in England in the 18th century where the people would uh, smash uh, uh, um, the equipment, because that equipment uh, is taking their jobs. Yes. So uh, we, yeah. we always live in a world which is sort of pregnant with that sort of uh, problem. True. And that's, again, the, the change problem, right? The change. But I think going to the, to the younger ages also would help. So I'll, maybe we can emphasize one more, the education from early stage. And education in every village. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And maybe that brings us also to the educational technologies to reach them. Because mm -hmm. if you want the schools in every village to be modern, it's very hard to do it in, in bringing the best teachers to the village and, so, you, and the best laboratories and the best books and so on. The best thing to do is to give them internet, to give them the connection and to provide the best dynamic multimedia courses via the internet, via e-learning. Mm -hmm. like, like anywhere else, 
uh, education is a very, the best recipient of new technologies. You mentioned the Armenian Virtual College earlier. With AVC 15 years ago, we looked at e-learning and we said technology is a gift to Armenians. So Armenians around the globe can benefit from e-learning to, to learn Armenian heritage, to learn Armenian culture, to learn Armenian language and history. And we succeeded in 110 different countries around the world, people adopted the Armenian Virtual College courses. In this case, the goal was not to develop the economy, but rather to pass on the Armenian heritage from generation to generation and to let them learn our, our wealth, our heritage, right? And we did that with 35,000 people today. And by the way, that increased a lot during COVID because COVID people have the time and the savviness of technology. So we, we saw that our e-learners multiplied by four times. <laughs> it increased very quickly. Since then, we every quarter, uh, the Army Virtual College teaches four times more people and started. But more importantly, I think that experience of e-learning that we have in AVC or elsewhere, we need to adopt it inside Armenia to bring the best knowledge to the villages, the best STEM education programs, hmm? the science, technology. It's very hard to have laboratory in every school. Hmm? You can have small labs here and there, but to make it massive, to make it uh, scalable, hmm? you have to use a technological education. And you can teach the physics, the biology, the math in the, in the most interesting, most interactive, engaging ways in every village. The, the young kids in those villages have the right to learn and then to contribute hmm, to the society, to create their own startups, to, to work in the multinationals, to create, to, to, do in, to become innovative. But that has to start from that ground. If my, my schools in the villages are not strong enough, they're not giving enough quality of education, I'm losing a good chunk of youth who will not be participating in the knowledge-based economy. Uh, let me interrupt our conversation for a second, because yes. uh, one of our listeners, Bagrat Pogosian, I think he's from Gyumri, he's, he says, I know the history about digital pomegranate company in Gyumri. They started the company with 10 people. Uh, so it's it's rather like a comment coming from him uh, rather yes. than a question. Yes. And just to talk to, to say to our listeners, you are free to ask questions and I will be happy to post some of them to the, the best questions, obviously, to our guests, who is uh, Girvan Zorian to me. Now, uh, again, I mean, you see this part of our conversation is going about the change, the need for change and the resistance to change. And uh, one of the changes that we have to come through is about increasing our productivity. Yes. Uh, because now uh, Armenians in general, we are working with quite a low productivity. Uh, uh, 10 in the morning, Yerevan is still sleeping if there are no schools which is not the best way to start uh, the life and not the best way to be productive. Uh, and what I can notice here in Armenia, that there are loads of people who are just not interested in uh, increasing their productivity. And uh, uh, they probably they want changes, but they don't want to change themselves. And this is a big problem, isn't it? It is. It is. But productivity is a result of motivation, I think. Hmm? Probably they are not motivated. That's why they are not productive. Not that they are lazy in nature, but they need the motivation. They need a reason for to become productive, right? In, in, in our companies, for instance, we, we worked for the last 15 months and until today we work from home, right? We didn't open our offices because of COVID and everybody works from home the productivity within this 15 months went up. It didn't go down because they had the motivation. They had their deadlines, they had their schedules, they had their, their, their management, their teamwork. So, so if you, you, you build that system around them, it's a culture. If you build that system around them, then they have to be productive. In fact, 
because people are doing less things socially all around the world, by the way. In technology companies, we saw an increase in productivity for about 15%. Why? Because they have a little bit more time to produce. Uh, they are not doing traffic. They are not wasting time between the office and, and, the, and the home and so on. So productivity is going up. But for that, you need the motivation. And I think in Armenia, if we build that motivation, if they're part of their companies, either their own company, some other company, they are shareholders in their companies. So there's the financial motivation. There's the success factor in multiple ways, not only financial. If they understand that, I think they can, they can become productive. What we need to do is to, to, to create that, that motivation. Uh, our conversation, unfortunately, is slowly moving to its end. But there is uh, one question that I still wanted to ask you. What is uh, Silicon Valley culture? And, always, um, and how we can apply it here in Armenia? Sure, sure. Silicon Valley culture, maybe it goes back to your previous question as well. It's a culture of partnership. It's a culture where individuals can create some things and others can work with them as partners. The reason it succeeds because the, the person with science in mind, the person who is entrepreneur in mind, the person who is a accountant, who is a lawyer, who is a marketing, they can come together and partner together easily. They are, they're sitting next to each other. It doesn't matter whether physically or virtually, but they can collaborate. And they are not looking for immediate gain. They believe in success. Therefore, they take some risk. So part of that culture is, if you are my lawyer, I can pay you by shares. I can, say, I can give you so many shares. If I succeed at my company, you make money as well. I go to my accountant, I do the same. And it's acceptable. If I go elsewhere in some other country, in some other culture, that may not work. You say, I am your, your lawyer. I need this much in advance. In Silicon Valley, I don't need to do that. So, so the mentality here is such that success belongs to everybody. If I'm, I have my own company as a CEO, I'm succeeding. The people in my company, my employees will succeed as well because I gave them shares. You will succeed as well as my lawyer or others, same way. So it's a partnership. If that partnership mentality works, we can replicate it. Unfortunately, not everywhere in the world that is doable because people don't like to take risks sometimes. They want to guarantee their income. But in Silicon Valley, there is no guaranteed income. There is a risk because if you're trying something new, you may succeed or you may not. But by getting help from others, you will succeed because alone you cannot do anything. You can, you can work on it together with others, with partnership, and your lawyer will succeed and your accountant will succeed and your marketing will succeed and the venture capitalist will succeed as well. And there is another question. From um, uh, from a person I interviewed last week, uh, that's oh. Ruben Injikian. He says, yes, "How can we absorb the Silicon Valley culture and motivation in Armenia through existing and emerging links between them? I believe not only through these links, but uh, there should be other ways as well." Absolutely. Well, absolutely. So what I mentioned about Silicon Valley mentality or culture that partnership aspect, that collaborative aspect hmm, can be also in Armenia. It needs nurturing. Hmm? I think the business culture in Armenia improved a lot. Hmm? I've noticed it during the, the three decades that, that we are working with the technology sector in Armenia. There's a huge change in the, in the mentality, in the business culture. Hmm? They understand about startup, they understand about success, they understand about uh, from raising money to doing marketing pitch. So, so all of these are, the, what I mentioned about these 15 companies that we accelerated recently was a very good example of taking Armenian startups and bringing them to, to, to Silicon Valley to show that acceleration. Now, what they learned can be utilized in Armenia for the next companies and the following companies as well. So this is a, it's a culture. It, it, it continues to build by itself. So I, I think Rupen's question is, is, it has a very good point. We really need to, to replicate as much as we can. Hmm? And we from here, and I'm sure Armenians around the globe, but we from Silicon Valley, we are, we are willing to work with, with any set of uh, startups or, or larger companies in order to bring that, that connectedness. We have a richness, right? 
being a global nation, being a distributed nation is a richness. Not everybody has. It. Let's take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Communication is easy. People are around the world, so the networks can be built. So that connection is 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 not difficult to create. Uh, networks networks can be built, even though in many ways we are speaking in two different Armenian languages. Yours is yes. Western Armenian, and mine is the Eastern. But we perfectly understand each other in whatever yeah, absolutely. Language we're doing. Thank absolutely. you very much. Indeed. Thank you. My, My pleasure. Today was Dr. Yervan Zorian, the president of Synopsis Armenia and the chief technologist for uh, Synopsis, a global company based in Silicon Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.